so that hopefully we can see one another. For those of you who've just joined us, my name is Mdun Duli from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. And it is our pleasure to welcome you to this special webinar event hosted by the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center in partnership with the Armenian Youth of South Africa, as well as our special speaker um, in this year's commemoration, Dr. Hashig Moradian. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your evening or out of your morning or afternoon, wherever you're joining us uh, from to, to be with us uh, for this special occasion. It is now three minutes past 7 p.m. South African time. Um, so officially, it is my honor, my privilege to, to welcome all of you to, to this year's commemoration. The Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day or Armenian Genocide Memorial Day, in fact, is a public holiday in Armenia and the Republic of Artsakh and is observed, is observed by the Armenian diaspora on 24 April every year. So it is held annually to commemorate the victims of the Armenian Genocide of 1915 during World War One, This evening's event is titled The Closed Circle of Our Exile, Memory and Commemoration. Tonight's special speaker, as mentioned, is Dr. Hashig Muradian. In today's address, Dr. Muradian will explore the memory, commemoration, and memorialization of the Armenian Genocide from its immediate aftermath through the centenary in 2015. Analyzing stages of remembering, reminding, and demanding justice as survivors and their descendants reconstructed community-like life, uh, community life away from their ancestral towns. Um, we are also honored to have Mr. David Abrahamian, who is the leader of the Armenian Youth of South Africa. Mr. Abrahamian will also honor us with a brief special address this evening. Towards the end of the event, we will have a question and answer session where our speaker will address any questions and comments from the audience. So please stay until the end of the event to be part of that question and answer session. Just some housekeeping guidelines for this event that I would like to briefly share with you. Please note that this event is being recorded. If you uh, um, are happy with appearing on record, you are most welcome to keep your video on. However, please keep your sound on mute throughout the event so that we don't have any background noises interfering with tonight's presentation. However, I do encourage you to use the chat function to communicate with us. Please post your questions and comments throughout the event and our team will gather those questions and comments and present them to our speaker when we engage in the question and answer session. It is now my pleasure to invite Mr. Abrahamian to address us first. Thanks, Mdu. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've been working uh, with Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center since 2014, and quite fruitfully, uh, we've, we've managed to put together some interesting events and speakers, and I think uh, today uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Muradzan speak on a topic that is quite important for us as we go through already 107 years and going forward. And I'm looking forward to hear details of what, what his view is on this. Um, just for those of you who are not familiar with our community here, um, it's a relatively small community compared to uh, other countries. Uh, so, but it's got probably about 100, over 100 years of history from 1896 to what we know. Um, and we are uh, very grateful to Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and the director Tali Nates and do already for a few years working with us on our projects. 
and for sharing our story, our ancestral stories with the South African public. Um, and hopefully the exchange of understanding of the importance of remembrance of both Armenian genocide or any other genocide is what, what's going to bring, hopefully at some point, us to a point of understanding uh, how to recognize perpetrators, how to recognize the rhetoric that leads to such events at any scale, be that small pogroms or massacres, or be that at a large scale genocide. So I think I'll cut short on that. And uh, Dr. Muradian, looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Ibrahimian. Um, for that for that brief address. Now it is my pleasure to present Dr. Hashig Muradian. Dr. Hashig Muradian is a lecturer in Middle Eastern, South Asia, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University and the Armenian and Georgian Area Specialist at the Library of Congress in the African and Middle Eastern Division. Dr. Moradian is the author of the Resistance Network, the Armenian Genocide and Humanitarianism in Ottoman Syria, 1915 to 1918. He's a co-editor of After the Ottomans, Genocide's Long Shadow and Armenian Resilience, which will be published this year in 2022. And the IB Taurus Handbook of the Late Ottoman Empire, History and Legacy Under Contract. He's also the editor of the peer-reviewed journal, The Armenian Review. Dr. Moradian has published articles on concentration camps, unarmed resistance, the aftermath of mass violence, midwifery in the Middle East, and approaches to teaching history. At Columbia University, Dr. Moradian teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on urban space and conflict in the Middle East, war, genocide, and aftermath, apologies and non-apologies, literature of the Great War in the Middle East, and a social history of concentration camps. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present Dr. Hashig Moradian. Uh, thank you, Mdu. Thank you, uh, Tali Nates. Uh, thank you, David, for your uh, uh, introductory comments. Uh, this is uh, a pleasure and honor for me to be here. Uh, we have been uh, exchanging emails, uh, messages over the past several months with the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center uh, to schedule uh, a conversation on, on the Armenian Genocide. And I'm glad that we uh, managed to, in fact, pin down a date which is uh, particularly meaningful for Armenians and for those who, uh, for whom, uh, you know, genocide commemoration and, and uh, remembering the past is, is important. Uh, April 24th today, uh, as it is the, uh, the day that uh, Armenians have chosen to commemorate the destruction of their people, dispossession of their people that occurred uh, over a number of years, but began on April 24, 1915, as World War I was raging. So today, in fact, I will be talking in part, at least, about commemoration. And therefore, uh, the, uh, there's an added meaning to the fact that we are holding this event on the very day of said commemoration. I'd like to first start though with a few words about uh, just a quick overview about the Armenian genocide. And uh, in order to sort of uh, set the ground uh, on which in the, in, the, in the next half hour or so, I will be building uh, a narrative of uh, resilience, revival, commemoration, and at the same time addressing uh, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly uh, current events. You know, it's uh, one of the realities of, uh, you know, of us who are working in the field of human rights, uh, history, 
uh, journalism uh, or anything that involves uh, public discourse, discussion and interaction of this sort is to uh, not lose sight of the fact that we are, uh, and this is true no matter when we're engaged in this conversation, we are uh, in a world where yes, there is commemoration. Yes, there is. there are those who will stand up against uh, mass violence and crimes and, and, and uh, institutions that will memorialize it, but also there is ongoing mass violence. And it's important to not lose sight of that. Uh, as, as we speak today, uh, you know, such crimes are being committed across the world, uh, you know, from uh, the Rohingya situation to parts of Africa, to Europe. Uh, of course, uh, much of the attention uh, particularly uh, these over the past month or so has been on Ukraine. Uh, so in many ways, uh, it is important to not lose sight of the reality that as we are commemorating a crime that began 107 years ago, uh, but which still casts a very long shadow for Armenians and their, uh, for the survivors uh, whose numbers are increasingly dwindling. Uh, there are very few survivors of the Armenian genocide who are alive today, and, and those are, uh, as you can imagine, they were, you know, children, uh, very young when the genocide occurred. But the descendants uh, and their descendants, uh, me being uh, one of them, uh, still carry uh, the, uh, the shadow or uh, operating under the shadow of that crime, trying to push back against that, that, that shadow and trying to shed light on it. So, uh, so this is sort of, uh, uh, let me start with a brief overview of the Armenian genocide itself. And uh, the Armenian genocide began, as I mentioned earlier on April 24, 1915. Armenians commemorate this day because it is on that day in 1915 a few months, just a few months after World War I had begun and the Ottoman Turkey had essentially entered the war on the side of Germany, uh, you know, under the cover of war, the uh, Ottoman Turkish authorities decided to deport and uh, dispossess and massacre the Armenian uh, population of the Ottoman Empire uh, this is, we're talking about a population of close to 2 million, uh, uh, in, in, uh, quite prosperous in a number of cities across the Ottoman Empire, including Istanbul, which was the capital, but also a population that was very much representative of the general population of the empire, be they, you know, Muslims, other Christians, Greeks, others, Jews, etc., in terms of having, you know, an active, robust community life, uh, you know, uh, in the case of Armenians and other, other groups, uh, including Muslims, significant uh, portion of the population were, uh, were peasants, lived in uh, rural areas. And uh, as such, uh, for uh, centuries, right, under Ottoman dominion, Armenians had learned how to, how to not just survive, but in certain circumstances to even thrive. Yet, uh, Beginning in the late 19th century, uh, with increasing uh, uh, ferocity, uh, cases of pogroms and massacres against the Armenian population uh, increased. This is largely this largely had to do with uh, nationalism. This largely had to do with the uh, circumstances in which Armenians found themselves as the uh, uh, local chieftains, sometimes Kurdish, sometimes other. Uh, would extract uh, additional taxes, would uh, dispossess, uh, steal from uh, the local Armenian population, and the Armenian population had very little recourse for any kind of justice. So this was uh, a situation that was brewing for uh, over decades. And uh, whenever the Armenians did speak up, whenever the Armenians did appeal to the Sultan, uh, there was very little attention paid to the plight of Christians, of course, uh, for a number of reasons, including the fact that the Sultan did not, Sultan did not want to alienate, you know, 
uh, the, the Muslim population in many of these areas. Uh, and, and, and so there was this, this was a, one of the precipitating factors uh, of Armenian discontent, right? And, and the horrors committed against Armenians, massacres sometimes. One other manifestation of this would be that when Armenians appealed to the Sultan, to the Ottoman Turkish leadership, and nothing came out of it, they also appealed to Europe, to the European powers, requesting their intervention. And European powers, again, used this opportunity. Uh, they did intervene every now and then politically. And uh, however, this intervention was not sustained. Sometimes it was marred by uh, the interests of the respective powers who, uh, whenever uh, received something back, took a step back. And, and then the Ottoman Turkish authorities turned towards the Armenian population and organized pogroms and massacres. So this was a situation where uh, Armenians were essentially caught pre-World War I in this net of, on the one hand, increasing, accumulating grievances within the Ottoman Empire, dispossession, theft, rape, etc. Uh, very little recourse for, uh, in order to be able to change anything, both within the empire or from outside. And uh, as World War I began, the Ottoman Turkish authorities uh, who were uh, anxious about the future of the empire, it's important to note that over uh, the previous decades, the Ottoman Empire had lost significant uh, portions of its territory, particularly in Europe. And uh, it was uh, the, the Ottoman leadership, Turkish leadership were very concerned about the heartland of what they considered to be uh, the Ottoman Empire, which also happened to be the ancestral lands of Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks. So Armenians being a, a, a large uh, population in that regard. And, and therefore, uh, they uh, found that the best way to resolve this issue once and for all would be to essentially annihilate the Armenian population of the empire. This way, there would not be any grievances. There would not be any appeals to Europe. And also, there would be this grand theft and dispossession of the Armenian people. Uh, and on that theft, uh, a new class of, uh, you know, uh, of, of Turkish, ultimately, citizens would, would emerge with the establishment of the Turkish Republic. And this is precisely what happened. Uh, beginning in 1915, uh, on April 24, just like today, Armenian intellectuals, leaders, artists were arrested in Istanbul, the capital at that point, and across the empire. And this at the same time was followed by a series of orders for uh, to exile, deport, and massacre the, the empire's uh, Armenian population. The massacres and deportations lasted for uh, uh, the duration of the war particularly uh, intense were the massacres that took place in, in, in the beginning in the fall of 1915, all the way into the summer of 1916, uh, depending on which region we are looking at. But ultimately, uh, this crime culminated in the destruction of uh, up to 1.5 million Armenians. Uh, this uh, destruction, this is not just a matter of, of course, uh, a vast, number of the Armenian population of the empire was, was killed or died of hunger, starvation, exposure. But also we are talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the decapitation of uh, a nation's entire leadership, artists, thinkers, the dispossession of the Armenian population, the, the loss of land and property, massive loss, right? and uh, the scattering of the survivors across the globe. Most of the Armenians who survived the Armenian genocide scattered around the globe, uh, you know, uh, from what is modern day Armenia to uh, all the way to China, Japan and beyond. And uh, as well as Euro Europe, uh, the Americas, uh, etc. Now, uh, this scattering, uh, essentially created what is today understood and known as the modern 
the Armenian diaspora and uh, the, the traditional uh, Armenian diaspora. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s, uh, there was a second you know, uh, infusion of Armenians into many of these communities coming from the Soviet Union, the, the, the former Soviet space. But uh, prior to that, overwhelmingly, the, di the Armenian diaspora, Armenian communities around the world were primarily comprised of uh, survivors of the Armenian genocide and their descendants. So this is the, the point at which, uh, you know, this is where I want to pick up and talk a little bit about commemoration, how Armenians commemorated this from the very beginning and, uh, and how this struggle eventually the commemoration morphed into a more robust outward looking global uh, advocacy campaign that led to, uh, you know, the recognition of the Armenian genocide uh, by a number of countries, more than 30 countries now, uh, mostly in Europe and, and, and the Americas, as well as, uh, you know, the development of uh, the field of Armenian genocide studies in general. Uh, the Armenian genocide is the second best studied case of genocide after the Holocaust. So we have a massive uh, scholarship that is increasingly growing as well. And, uh, and, and so much of this uh, in, a circumst in circumstances where we are talking about a community of survivors that was tiny, that was completely dispossessed and had to start life from scratch beginning in the 1920s, scattered all over the world. Uh, in my case, my ancestors were from different parts of the Ottoman Empire. It would have been impossible for them to meet had there not been uh, a genocide and dispossession and exile. They, uh, my, my grandparents, child survivors, met in Lebanon. That's where my parents were born, and that's where I was born and grew up. And uh, these are, this and similar stories are the reality of most Armenians around the world, right? They will all be able to trace back their history, their lineage, most of them, to uh, some part of historic Armenia, which was part of the Ottoman Empire up until, uh, you know, from uh, for centuries up until the empire uh, collapsed and the Turkish Republic was established. Now, it's important to also note that, uh, you know, the Armenian genocide is one of those cases where denial, erasure, and intimidation has not stopped with the, when the killing ended, right? This is, of course, true for many cases of genocide. Denial is, uh, unfortunately, part of the genocidal process itself. You know, it starts with the, with the crime and is something that continues uh, long after, right? We see uh, denial in its manifestations in most cases of genocide, but what is particularly uh, problematic and pernicious and, 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 and damaging in the, in the case of the Armenian genocide as well, is the persistent, active, engaged denial of, by the Turkish state that has been ongoing, that has been, uh, the denial of the Armenian genocide has been a central tenet of Turkish foreign policy and has manifested itself on a number of fronts. So, so this, is a, this is of course a major uh, you know, uh, hurdle to Armenians uh, moving on, to Armenians uh, having any kind of closure. And uh, if this is true now, three, four generations after the Armenian genocide, it was, uh, you know, the situation was all the more worse as we're gonna see early on where uh, we had these communities scattered around the world. And uh, in many, uh, often in countries where they do not even speak the local language, right? let alone be able to express themselves and make their voices be heard and tell their stories and experiences. So this is a critical context. The context of genocide denial is critical in this regard. Armenians commemorated the genocide almost immediately after the war. In fact, some smaller commemoration events had were held even before World War I ended. But the, the first major commemoration events are held in Berlin and in Constantinople in 1919, in March and May 1919. And it's, this is critical, you know, uh, the, uh, the Allies had won, the Central Powers, Germany, Turkey had lost the war. Uh, Istanbul was 
occupied. It is in this reality that in Istanbul, for example, the first uh, commemoration event was held. And uh, in, in the case of the 1919 commemoration, it was held on April 25th and brought together religious and sec uh, you know, uh, leaders, uh, secular readers of the community, lay members, and featured political speeches, artistic performances. Uh, the organizing committee also published a volume uh, on, this, uh, on this occasion featuring the biographies of uh, you know, the, the intellectuals who were murdered and accounts from surviving witnesses. So, uh, so this is early on. Uh, another component of this is that, uh, you know, beginning with the 1920s, these commemorations become more central to Armenian reality. Uh, in April, 1920, the Republic of Armenia, uh, there was a, uh, a republic uh, that was established in May of 1918 on the Russian side of the border, on the border with the Ottoman Empire. And uh, that republic was short-lived only for two years before being essentially becoming part of the Soviet Union. And in the Armenian Republic itself in April 1920, just months before Armenia lost its independence, the Catholicos of all Armenians, who is the supreme religious leader of the Armenian church, declared April 24, uh, a national day of remembrance and officiated over the memorial mass at the seat of the Catholicos in Armenia. You can imagine 1920, this is just, you know, a couple of years after the war had ended, uh, the gathering was as much an acknowledgement of persisting pain. Uh, you know, the country was full of refugees from and survivors of the genocide as it was a commemoration, right? There was a huge number of survivors with, within Armenia's shrinking borders. And uh, most of them were in fact surviving on humanitarian aid from the United States. So this national day of mourning, although it is shelved after Armenia becomes part of the Soviet Union, the Soviet authorities were not particularly keen on the National Day of Commemorating Genocide. And, uh, you know, Armenians in Armenia, the Republic, would have to wait several decades to be able to once again officially commemorate the genocide. And that happens in 1965 on the 50th anniversary. But it's worth noting that the, the declaration of April 24 as a uh, essentially the national day of mourning reverberates uh, within the Armenian diaspora. And by the early 1920s, you have annual commemorations being held. Uh, largely, the emphasis is on somber mourning and the religious tone. And, uh, and, and this is uh, what how Armenians are commemorating, often among themselves, right, without much uh, local or international attention. It's important when we're thinking about genocide and its aftermath to realize that, you know, it often takes the survivors a generation or more to even uh, rebuild their own lives, right? Uh, and, and, and try to put the pieces together uh, before they can even stand on their feet and, uh, you know, engage in activism and protest, etc., right? One of the things that genocide does is uh, really undermines a community's ability to uh, exist, uh, you know, and, and therefore this kind of, uh, so this is part of the struggle to emerge from the shadow of genocide, just first being able to stand up as a community. So the first two generations of survivors of the Armenian genocide, this was a central task for them. And uh, often, commemorations in this kind of context from Paris to the United States to different all over the Middle East, all the way to China, were very uh, introverted, were very uh, community focused, and you, you, we had essentially people who were mourning their own family members in the process, right? And uh, but as survivors reconstituted their community life away from their lands, uh, the memory uh, of, of the genocide and the memory of the lost 
villages and towns and the homeland became a very powerful uh, bond. Uh, people from the same village or town in historic Armenia would gather together for picnics, uh, would try to find one another in orphanages and form families together. Uh, this, this early generation is also a generation that oftentimes tried to memorialize uh, and remember those who were killed during the genocide and the towns and the villages that were left behind by naming their children after uh, these family members and these places. Uh, you know, I am named after uh, my, my grandfather, who himself is uh, essentially named after uh, his his ancestors, and in fact, I know as a fact that uh, my my grandfather struggled a long time to name his sons after uh, he had five sons, and after his uh, own lost relatives, and and there's a you know, complicated family uh, story about about that that struggle that he was going through after particularly his firstborn son dies. And he feels like it is because uh, he did not name him after one of his ancestors. Uh, so, so this becomes a central part of the uh, Armenian agony as, as the nation is trying to uh, rebuild itself. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have a situation where, you know, uh, you know, the scholar Marianne Hirsch will uh, refers to it, and let me quote her here. She says, to grow up with overwhelming inherited memories, to be dominated by narratives that preceded one's birth, is to risk having one's own life displaced, even evacuated by our ancestors, end of quote. And, and this was the displacement that children and grandchildren of the Armenian survivors reckoned with. They grew up in places like Aleppo, Paris, Detroit, with stories of uh, life in the, in the old country, in ancestral towns and villages, and personal accounts of the crime. Uh, Armenian poet Kevork Emin captured this duality in a very powerful poem uh, he wrote in 1967, uh, titled We. And this is where actually I, I got the title, The Close Circle of Our Exile from so let me read and share with you a portion of this poem. He says, we are half lame for wherever we set foot on Syrian sand, on a Paris sidewalk, on the banks of the Nile, our other foot is sunk in the snow of Masis mountain. Masis mountain is Mount Ararat, which is a symbol of uh, you know, the Armenian people, it's, it's, it's this dominant, you know, in the heart of uh, historic Armenia, this dominant, uh, you know, mountain. Uh, and we do not walk, we do not reach, we only trace the closed circle of our exile, wandering endlessly around the masses. So you see here this sense of uh, wandering and exile being such a central theme in, in the Armenian reality, as it is also manifested here in this poem. So, so this, is a, this is a challenge for the survivor generation. And, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, it's important to not portray survivors and, and, and those who are targeted for genocide as these passive victims who are constantly on the receiving end of violence, on the receiving end of injustice, but unable to do anything and unable to shape their reality and their future. No matter how restrictive, no matter how limited their agency, people will uh, push back. People will try to carve out, communities will try to organize and carve out a way to survive and rebuild their lives. And it's, this is true everywhere. And this is certainly true for the case of the Armenians. And this is what happens. Uh, you have across uh, the world in communities uh, you know, scattered around the globe, uh, this uh, effort to uh, rebuild. And by the time we approach the 50th anniversary of the Armenian genocide, Armenians are not just engaged in a more robust effort for recognition and justice, but they're also part of struggles that are that's beyond 
their own communities. They are now more confident to engage in discourse and discussion and politics within the societies that they now call their home. A good example is the, uh, the role that Armenians played as Rafael Lemkin, the person who coined the term genocide in the 40s and ultimately struggled to have uh, a genocide convention adopted by the United Nations and ultimately ratified by countries around the world, uh, some of Rafael Lemkin's closest allies, and this is something that's only recently is emerging in, in the scholarship and discussion, uh, were Armenian journalists and activists who were uh, supporting Lemkin, realizing the importance of the Genocide Convention and understanding it through their own experiences. Uh, and then uh, beginning with the 1960s, uh, particularly 1965, a new brand of Armenian commemoration emerges. This commemoration is uh, significantly more uh, open to the world. It's more assertive. It plays out in capitals around the world. On April 24, 1965, uh, we have huge demonstrations and protests demanding justice for the Armenian genocide in not just major capitals around the world, but also in smaller cities. You know, in, in France alone, some 25 cities, uh, you have you know, protests, demonstrations, and gatherings and commemorations. So there is this more engaged activism now that there's two generations later. Uh, a gen there is a generation that is born and raised in the diaspora, and they turn this struggle and, and place it uh, on uh, essentially on the international uh, arena in the, in the, move it into the international arena. And this is, this is a critical turning point. And we're sort of uh, uh, living right now in a, in a period in, in the history of Armenian genocide, uh, of the legacies of the Armenian genocide in, in this post-1965 period, which ultimately uh, it, it culminates in uh, an engagement, particularly beginning in the, in the 1980s and 90s, to uh, also seek acknowledgement for the Armenian genocide by the respective communities of the countries where Armenians surviving the genocide ended up in. So in a reality where the Turkish state vehemently denies that Armenians were killed and dispossessed, uh, Armenians turned turn to their own communities, to their own cities and towns and countries and governments and parliaments for acknowledgement. This acknowledgement was important for them, both uh, to gain some sense of closure and some uh, uh, measure of justice, and also to exert pressure on Turkey itself to engage with the history of the Armenian genocide and acknowledge it, and again, offer uh, some, some measure of reparations and justice. And this is the kind of struggle that begins early on, by the way, in uh, some uh, you know, South American countries, uh, one of the earlier, uh, the earliest recognition of the Armenian genocide, in fact, happens by Uruguay uh, in 1960, before the 50th anniversary, just a year before the 50th anniversary of the genocide. But beginning in the 90s and 2000s, one country after the other, most of Europe, uh, North America and South America acknowledged the Armenian genocide at different levels of government. And this struggle, uh, although in the press, is often framed as you know, uh, different countries doing the right thing, different countries uh, essentially engaging in this uh, in order to pressure Turkey, or uh, you know, and and the discussion is often framed within the context of geopolitics, within the context of how Turkey is going to react to these acknowledgments around the world, within the context of how. Uh, you know, th these are going to strain relations, say, between France and Turkey, when France acknowledged the genocide between the United States and Turkey, between uh, Canada and Turkey, etc. But oftentimes what is overlooked is the crucial role uh, Armenian engagement and activism played in much of this. It's critical to note that oftentimes the onus is on survivors to make their voices heard and to push for justice. Uh, no government 
will say, you know what, let's look into our history, try to find what crimes have been committed in our name and just go out and apologize for it and offer reparations. Justice comes only with sustained pressure and activism and engagement. And it's critical to acknowledge the fact that uh, Armenians embark on this path, beginning with the 50th anniversary. And we are still, uh, you know, although, you know, there's, a, there's been more than two, three generations now on that path, we are still marching on, on that path that has begun, right, with 1965 and the commemorations of the Armenian genocide turning uh, you know, essentially expanding and becoming a global phenomenon. And uh, in many ways, uh, as I mentioned, beginning in the 1990s, advocacy becomes, uh, you know, focused on parliaments and governments. Scholarship on the Armenian genocide also starts growing in this period with some pioneering, uh, you know, scholars doing critical work. Uh, within Turkey, there is a movement by intellectuals journalists, historians, often at the expense of being imprisoned, fined, losing their jobs, and sometimes killed uh, to speak out and demand that Turkey recognize the Armenian genocide. Commemorations for the first time are, are held open air commemorations in Turkey by civil society groups and small human rights groups in 2010. I was uh, privileged to be part of those early commemorations and often speak or participate in them in different capacities. And so, so but still that wall of denial, uh, you know, by the Turkish state remains firm. The Turkish state's position has shifted a little bit over the years in order to accommodate, you know, the initial denialist positions were very difficult to sustain and they crumbled very quickly. And the Turkish denialist narrative now is, is, is a little more nuanced, but still holds firm to the idea that there was no genocide against the Armenian people. Uh, to conclude, and perhaps I'm happy to expand on any aspect of this uh, in, in the discussion, but to conclude, I'd like to share a few images with you and then say a few words uh, in, as, as I do that, and we'll move afterwards with our discussion. So this is an image of uh, Deir Zor, uh, one of the central uh, sites of the Armenian genocide. Some scholars refer to it as the Auschwitz of the Armenian genocide. This is where uh, hundreds of thousands of Armenians are killed in the summer of 1916. Uh, it's a central uh, site with dotted in mass graves uh, in modern day Syria. This is where most Armenians were deported. Most surviving Armenians arrived and ultimately massacred, as I said, in the summer of 1916. Uh, this is, uh, these are images, by the way, that I took on a trip to this region in Syria, uh, right before the war, the civil war in Syria began. And, and so this was a, uh, a recently discovered at that point, a recently discovered mass grave that uh, was discovered as they were building a school. So this is the wall of the school. They built the school right next to the mass grave. So they don't build, uh, build it on the side of the grave. Uh, but it became the site where children, uh, you know, use it as, as their playground. And uh, this is, this is uh, an image of us there with a number of journalists. Uh, you know, all you do is scratch the surface and pieces of bone emerge. And when you ask the kids, what are these? They would say, you know, Armeni, Armeni in Arabic, meaning Armenians. And they would bring you pieces of bone themselves. They would be, you know, go around and collect them for you. And it's, uh, it, it is one of those uh, horrific, uh, aspects that I was alluding to earlier, because this is a region there is where you will see signs pointing to Iraq, you will see signs pointing to Turkey, and of course, different parts of Syria. And standing in front of those signs, right, in that city and out in the outskirts of that region, uh, we couldn't help but wonder about how much, the la about the layers of violence that had impacted, plagued that region over decades. And this was even before the civil war in Syria began. And uh, a, another critical component of the Armenian experience has been the destruction of cultural heritage, right? We, talk about, we talked about the loss of life and dispossession and loss of you know, property and land, but 
uh, you know, Darmian uh, homeland was uh, dotted by monasteries and churches uh, in, in the hundreds. And uh, in fact, close to 2000. And most of them were destroyed during the Armenian genocide and its immediate aftermath. But in subsequent decades, uh, leading up all the way into the 70s and 80s, you know, the Turkish authorities and the Turkish military uh, systematically destroyed what had survived. This is one example. These are monasteries that are built between the 10th and 13th centuries in a region close to, uh, you know, in the eastern parts of Turkey, uh, near Kars. Uh, five monasteries, they were all uh, essentially, the, the region was cordoned off just a few decades ago. The military put explosives in these structures and blew the whole thing up. Uh, this is a close-up image of the same Khazgong uh, monasteries, just four of them. The fifth one is further away, as you saw. And this is an image of the only one that has partly survived the explosion. I visited this site a few years ago. The area is just dotted with pieces of from the five monasteries, right? It's just, uh, it's just ruins and rocks all over. Uh, yet this structure, and I, I, I love this photograph because it shows, uh, yes, a scarred structure, a ruined and damaged, severely damaged structure, but also there's a sense of defiance to it. And in many ways is emblematic of the Armenian experience and the experience of peoples who go through these horrors of genocide and mass violence. And, uh, you know, survivors of the Armenian genocide were scattered all over the world. And Sometimes, you know, in fact, as far away as the northeastern corner of China. This is uh, an image of a brochure uh, for an event that was held in 1944 in the city of Harbin in northeast China. At that point, uh, the region, Manchuria, was under, uh, you know, occupied by the Japanese. There was a, essentially a puppet government that was set up. Uh, by the Japanese, uh, you know, in this region, it was referred to as Manchuko. And uh, as World War II is raging, you have the tiny little Armenian community, largely comprised of survivors of the genocide, gathering to celebrate an Armenian, uh, uh, you know, uh, holiday, uh, sacred holiday, uh, Saint Parthenons, which uh, commemorates. Uh, the struggle by uh, Bartan against the Persians in 451. And it's a, it's, a, it's a poignant example of survival and resilience of a small community of just a few hundred in a corner of the world when the world is at world war, at war, right? And there's, a, you know, occupation and suffering and pain all over, all around. And, and this is an image from uh, a child of a survivor of uh, who, uh, you know, she was born in, in Harbin and she uh, grew up there and, and lived there for several decades before moving to the United States. And uh, we have some of these photographs thanks to her. Uh, she collected all these documents and images and uh, donated it to an archive in Fresno. I will be brief and I will conclude with this. Uh, uh, with this image again. Uh, this is an image from that I showed you from Derzor, where the Armenian genocide, uh, you know, the, the most, uh, the, the largest massacre of the Armenian genocide took place. And this is that site that I mentioned earlier, the mass grave where the children were, which the children were using as their playground. And here's a poem written by a child survivor of the genocide who eventually becomes a prominent educator, poet, writer, Musher Ishkhan, and I've translated it to English. So he says, you do not know me. I am that child raised with love who exhausted and half nude, fell asleep in the desert of their Zor to never wake up. I do not want adornments nor any warm woolen clothes. Skeletons are always nude. But when you get warm bread from the baker, Make sure to remember me. Over the past 107 years, this is uh, precisely what the Armenians have done. 
not only have they remembered initially their own family members, their own communities, their own towns, and its, dist and, 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 and its destruction, uh, but ultimately they have also, uh, as, as, as I talked about in this presentation, right, opened up to the world, telling their stories and making their voices heard, and ultimately pushed for uh, bending the arc of history, the proverbial arc of history towards justice. Uh, and in many ways, uh, we owe to that survivor generation, uh, the resilience that we see today among uh, many Armenian communities to push for justice but also the efforts that we see around the globe by Armenians in addition and next to others and other communities who are affected by genocide to actually create uh, solidarities and engage in action to prevent and fight against current crimes and injustices. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Moradian for, for that um address that line at the, the poem that you shared with us that last line make sure to remember me I, that's very emotional because this is written by a child or the, even though um when the when the the poet wrote it he was already a little bit older but as a child it's written from a child's perspective and i thought that was very powerful that last line make sure to remember me and um, at this point i'm going to um, encourage people to start posting their questions to begin our question and answer session, um, Dr. Dr. Moradian, my first question is exactly about children. I want to touch on that, that topic of children and education. I was wondering, is the Armenian genocide included in any curriculum of, of which country? Is it taught in Armenia? Is it taught in, in Syria? Or where is it taught and how is it taught? Uh, uh, thank you. That is a great question that does not get asked that often. Well, let me start with where I am. In the United States, the Armenian genocide is part of the curriculum in a number of states. It's, it is mandated uh, uh, in a number of states. Uh, and uh, regardless, it is taught in uh, many schools increasingly uh, in, uh, in recent years. And the same is true with the university level, right? Uh, I do remember that, uh, you know, even 10 years ago when I had just arrived in this country, uh, well, a little over 10 years ago. And I used to ask when I, I used to often speak to uh, high school students, university students, and I used to ask them like, who among you here has heard about the Armenian genocide and how? And I used to get mixed, uh, you know, uh, results in a sense that most students, even who those who had heard about the genocide, had done so from not from school. They'd learned it from the army rock band system of a down, which was like you know world famous uh, and still is, or say the Kardashians or things like that, as opposed to uh, you know you know you know education, the curriculum, etc. But increasingly, that this has changed, and I've seen that right. Uh, this is uh, this is one point as far as the United States is concerned. The Armenian genocide is also taught in different countries. Europe, uh, certainly it's taught in uh, very briefly, uh, but also it's part of the curriculum in a number of other countries. Uh, oftentimes it's folded within World War One. Oftentimes uh, it's taught within uh, in the context of Holocaust education. I have to say I have uh, you know here in the, in North America, but also in other countries. Uh, I've, I've, I've met, worked with a number of Holocaust educators who uh, make the Armenian genocide an integral part of their, uh, their you know, instruction. So, so this is, there's a combination of uh, states, uh, countries that sort of uh, have some kind of framework uh, to teach the genocide, but also individual initiatives and initiatives of institutions. Increasingly, this is growing, and uh, and I do think that there's 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 much more space here for that kind of broader growth. I personally am one of those who believe in 
uh, teaching cases of mass violence uh, in in a way that engages students and makes them think about different aspects of uh, uh, of our own realities around us. And in in that way, in that regard, I often uh, teach cases that are uh, less known, right? Uh, like the Herero genocide and, and, and others, again, because it, it also offers us an opportunity to think about why, right, we know less about these cases and why it is important for us to reflect on, on these cases and their legacies, right? Of course, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the center being in, in Johannesburg, not too far, far from, you know, what used to be German Southwest Africa and Namibia, right? Uh, you know, South Africa was also, uh, you know, indirectly impacted by the, uh, some of the survivors of the Herero genocide who essentially arrived in the region. Uh, so, so these are uh, critical questions for me. And I do see, uh, you know, genocide education in general as an opportunity to think, to, uh, to teach students, not just about, you know, major cases of genocide, but also uh, about you know, what, what is remembered, how it, things are remembered, what is forgotten, and, and the importance of that, as well as emphasizing the agency of the victims and the targeted groups. That's another component, important element of the way in which I view this. So thank you for the question. I went a little beyond the question because I think <laughs> it's, a, it's a critical issue. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I do, I do have another question from an audience member, but before I ask that question, the children in your presentation from Syria who were playing with the bones? How how do they know that this that 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 is a graveyard of of Armenians? How how is that told to them? Yes. So in many of these uh, okay. sites uh, in in Syria, uh, the destruction of the Armenians is just part of the memory of the region, right? Uh, what has happened is that over generations, a few, so uh, with the destruction of the Armenians and in particularly around, as I said, 1916 in that region, in subsequent decades, first of all, many of those who survived, particularly children uh, and some women also, uh, hundreds of them in fact, were integrated into the local uh, tribes and families of, of you know, uh, Muslim tribes and families uh, and were assimilated into them. And to this day, you have uh, in those parts of Syria, uh, many who trace and you know their ancestry back to a grandmother or a great grandmother who was a survivor of uh, of the genocide, was lost to the Armenian community in a sense because she became part of uh, these tribes and and, and families and uh, and and ult but ultimately that memory has been passed on. So this is a place where uh, you know also I mean you know, massacring hundreds of thousands of people in a region, uh, in, 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 a, in a small area, relatively small, of course, like that is, is bound to, to have uh, that kind of long shadow. There are for decades accounts of, you know, people tilling the land, right? And finding pieces of bones and skulls, right? So it's just, you know, the region is uh, dipped uh, in, in this uh, horrendous experience in, in many ways. And that memory is there. And it's passed on to the next generation. Uh, so that is how these children know. And uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, of course, uh, speaking of the children, uh, because that image that I showed you of that group, uh, and I've mentioned this in a number of other talks, uh, these children actually, uh, theirs or became a flashpoint of the civil war in Syria in recent years. And most of these kids were scattered, uh, you know, had were forced out, scattered into, you know, refugee camps or other countries like Lebanon and Jordan, Turkey and elsewhere. And uh, I always, you know, often ended my talks by asking this rhetorical question about what happened to these kids. I wonder where they are, right? They're standing here on top of a mass grave of victims of the Armenian genocide, but they themselves became targets of violence, uh, you know, by different armed groups, uh, including, of course, uh, ISIS. And uh, you know, and what is their reality, and what what kind of future are we leaving them? And will they be able to, with our support, emerge from that shadow of mass violence, 
And as I asked these rhetorical questions, uh, you know, months ago, I received a message on Facebook from a man in Syria who told me that that boy in the front of the picture with the white t-shirt was actually killed in Derzor during the war. So these children are also not only are the bearers of memory, transgenerational, uh, but now they are the bearers of scars that they themselves are going to be passing on to the next generation. Mm. Wow, that's chilling. That uh, about the boy um, in the picture. Uh, thank you. I have a question from Tazlim, who's saying, "Thank you, Doctor, for your wonderful presentation. My question is." What would you like the Turkish government to do regarding this genocide? Would you appreciate if they acknowledge it? And do you think they will acknowledge it in the future? Uh, thank you. Uh, excellent question, of course. Uh, I am uh, one of those who believes in Gramsci's thought, uh, you know, point about the optimism of the will and the pessimism of the intellect. I do think that it's important for us to struggle for uh, truth, justice, uh, even if intellectually we know that it's very difficult to achieve, even if intellectually sometimes we are pushed to pessimism, I do uh, believe in the importance of that uh, optimistic struggle because that's all we got, that's one. Now, uh, what do I expect uh, from the Turkish state? First and foremost, I would start with the fact that denial is not just about uh, not telling the truth and giving closure to a community about a crime that took place a long time ago, but it also has uh, current implications. So the moment you have acknowledgement by the Turkish government and state, right, it means that this is already a different kind of state, is a different kind of government the way it interacts and uh, deals with geopolitical issues and, and domestic issues is different. It is not a government and a state that is resorting to violence to address and solve issues. And this is true for the Turkish Republic for decades now. You know, and in many ways, uh, Armenians have also been on the receiving end of this ongoing violence. Just recently in Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, you know, there was, uh, you know, the displacement and the ethnic cleansing of, you know, thousands of Armenians in just two years ago during the pandemic as Azerbaijan attacked the region. And this attack happened with the open support of the Turkish state, government, military. In fact, a decisive factor in the war were the Turkish drones that were given to Azerbaijan. A Turkey that has acknowledged the Armenian genocide it would be very difficult for us to fathom that it would be capable of this kind of action. So in many ways, uh, I would think that an acknowledgement in and of itself, right, would, trans would be either would transform uh, the reality of the Turkish state uh, that has been very much the reality for, for decades now, but also it would come at the same time as a result of the transformation of Turkish state. It's a chicken and egg situation. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough struggle, but ultimately I do expect uh, full acknowledgement and uh, reparations for the Armenian genocide. Now, what kind of form and shape it takes? It is a question that is something that, you know, only time will tell. Do I expect this to happen very soon? Uh, no. Do I ex expect this to happen? Yes. Why? Because I also believe in not just the struggle of Armenians and their allies and the you know, intersectional struggles of this world, but because I also believe ultimately in that the citizens of Turkey themselves, right, are going to at some point be able to transform their own realities and uh, create a country and a state that has the courage and the ability and the willingness uh, to confront this issue. Uh, so that optimism of, of the will uh, has, has many reasons. It emanates from uh, my, as a historian and as an Armenian, my knowledge of my community, but also it emanates from as someone who believes in intersectional struggles, my faith in 
uh, that kind of struggle on, uh, in, this, in the world today. And also my faith in the fact that people will not always uh, remain uh, complicit, right? In denial, dispossession and destruction. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that, for that answer. And then I have another question from David, who's asking, how does memory of genocide affect current Armenian identity? especially in various subcultures of diverse communities? Uh, it is important to uh, thank you for the question. Again, these are great questions. Uh, the, the memory of the Armenian genocide has really uh, played a significant role in mobilizing Armenians uh, across the world, particularly during the period when Armenia was under Soviet uh, rule, right? Soviet Armenia, uh, you know, when Armenia gained independence, of course, I, I think Armenian engagement and activism became more multifocal, right? Uh, there was uh, also an outpouring of support and engagement that came with having uh, a homeland that is now independent uh, in the early 90s. But before that, in many ways, the Armenian genocide was one of the central uh, uh, issues around which that, that issues that galvanized Armenians, mobilized Armenians, and uh, uh, and also became a, a way in which Armenian identity was preserved. So Armenian identity was in many ways, you know, I can give the my own example. I grew up in Lebanon, going uh, during the civil war, uh, going to an Armenian school, which was also part of, of course, the Lebanese curriculum, you know. Uh, but also, you know, we had Armenian language and history class. And he, this was centered, the, the Armenian genocide and that experience was central to our experience and our learning and our education. We were expected, right? It was a duty for us to learn the language because there was an effort to kill those who spoke it. There was, we, we were, you know, so there was this, the genocide was also a burden in a certain way, in the sense that it was a responsibility, right? I often tell uh, Armenian students uh, nowadays that you know being Armenian, you know, in this in today's world should not be uh, or uh, advocating for the Armenian genocide or celebrating Armenian identity as part of one's different identities, right? Should not be a burden. It should be something we uh, we we celebrate. And, and so oftentimes, for, for a very long time, and understandably, under the shadow of denial, uh, you know, this, the, the Armenian genocide has become, has been a central theme of mobilization and engagement with Armenian identity in the diaspora. With the, as I mentioned, with the independence of Armenia, this has shifted. And right now, uh, Armenian youth have a number of, you know, fields where they can be engaged with their identity, right? And that's, I think, quite enriching and important. Thank you. Thank you for that. In fact, Marie um, just wrote a, a comment, not a question really, but a comment. She says, my grandparents were survivors of the genocide and they taught me a lot about the language and the culture, my own, their behalf, on their behalf, I want to thank you so much for keeping the memories alive. God bless you and others who remember. My own granddaughter is listening to your talk. So thank you. that's 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 very moving. Yes, and then um, and Tali Nate also. She's saying Tali, who's not in South Africa at the moment, but she's saying, in fact, she's in the United States actually. She's saying thank you so much for an excellent and moving talk. So uh, let me see if there are any other questions from anyone else. Uh, I do seem to, let me see. I think I have one more question or comment. So this is from Morphe Dool or Morphe Dahl or Morphe Dool. Um, and they're saying, thanks for your inspiring speech. As you said, recognition and justice are very important for the survivors 
Bangladesh genocide happened 50 years ago. Unfortunately, it became a forgotten genocide for the global community. We appreciate the role Armenians played in getting recognition of Armenians in getting, appreciate the role Armenians played in getting recognition of Armenians. Um, maybe there's a typo there. What, and so she, they're asking, what is your suggestion regarding bringing back Bangladesh genocide in the global map of genocide of the 20th century? Uh, uh, thank you for that question. In fact, uh, interestingly, I have a, uh, a master student who is writing on the uh, Bangladesh Bangladesh case. Uh, her thesis right now, uh, particularly on the in the post on the post seventy one period, and uh, how it is reflected in in textbooks in the region. And uh, I, my uh, I, I'm very cautious to give advice or to be prescriptive to uh, to other communities who have, of course, their own particularities in terms of the way they can organize and mobilize. But I do believe that uh, in, in general, right? Some of the points that I made earlier, maybe I should make it in a, ca a case of the genocide in this specific case. Uh, I do believe in the, in the fact that uh, if the community does not, you know, uh, is, is willing to engage in activism, and keep it, uh, keep that activism sustained, right? I think that is the first and the most important component of any uh, effort for acknowledgement. We live in a reality where even more so than any period before, uh, people's attention are very uh, fleeting and brief. Uh, we have, we're being bombarded with information. We are being exposed to uh, you know, all kinds of violence every day in the here and now. For many people, they're having difficulty uh, processing all of that, processing their own personal challenges. Just the recent years and the pandemic and everything has had such a toll on people's mental health and, and, and realities and every day. Uh, in this reality, as we're being bombarded with uh, news about crimes taking place in Yemen, in, in uh, other parts of the world. Of course, in Ukraine, uh, most prominently these days, that's where the focus is. Uh, it becomes uh, very difficult for people to have that bandwidth, right? To engage in and try to push for acknowledgement of crimes that have occurred decades in the past. Unless there is that kind of mobilization and unless there is that kind of engagement by the communities that are affected by it, that, that is critical. The second aspect is, I think, uh, and this is something that uh, is not, of course, you know, some people would disagree with me, but I believe in intersectional struggles. I believe that we are all stronger when we are standing for the injustices next door, the injustices in our, in our own backyards, as we expect others to stand for the injustices that we have faced. And I do think that that kind of intersectional approach is also critical. You know, we, uh, it makes us stronger because suddenly we do not become a community that has been targeted and affected by one crime. We become a community that has members from, uh, you know, different forms, not even, not, not just genocide, we're talking about all kinds of injustices, right? Uh, and, and that makes us stronger. And th that expands that, that space of empathy that we have, that space of engagement that we have and makes us, uh, I, I firmly believe uh, individuals who are more uh, in, in tune with their surrounding and with their realities. And, and that's, that, that, that is all I can say. Uh, I say that because again, I think it's up to the communities to go and choose their what they deem to be the best way to remember and remind uh, the world or the region about what happened to them. Of course, in the case of Bangladesh as well, there are real life consequences to, to, to the crimes that were committed. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it is our job to stand next to those who are targeted or were targeted and are seeking justice in, in that pursuit. So I, I'm, I'm wary about saying, uh, 
being prescriptive. I'm open to being uh, in solidarity. Yes, thank you. That makes sense to me. I agree with you on that. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, from David, very, very, very last question and, and point. And David is saying, great point. Do you find that Armenian immigrants have adequately processed their trauma and are able to empathize with others? Great question again. Uh, it's a it's a complicated question, of course, and it's difficult to say. Uh, it you know it's a you know in different places uh, the situation is different. Different in individuals think about this differently. Uh, let me give uh, you know here's here's the reality. When small groups, nations, targeted minorities, not just national by the way, uh, uh, gender, religion, you name it often find themselves in, in the following re, uh, reality. They feel and think that there's so few of us or we are so oppressed systematically, right? Let's say the LGBTQ communities around the world, right? That if we're going to struggle, if we're going to pick one struggle, right? It better be our own because we don't have the luxury of really engaging with all these different crimes. We ourselves are targeted and have been targeted, right? And this is true, of course, for many groups, particularly, as I said, smaller groups and small nations, Armenians among them. Armenians feel that, you know, we're a small nation. We already are up against these, you know, regional superpower, Turkey, right? That's actively engaged in denial. Uh, we live in countries that are sometimes, oftentimes allied with Turkey and therefore very cautious with this. We, are, we live in countries sometimes that also have a love-hate relationship with Turkey, even if they're not allied with it. And there's that complicating factor. And, and therefore it's, they, they may see, many people may see it as a challenge to engage in, you know, or a luxury to engage in other, act, you know, in activism outside of their community. And you know I, that's a personal choice, but I I would argue that part of the way in which we uh, to go back to the wording of your uh, question we process the trauma is by actually engaging outside of our communities, coming out of our communities, seeing that others have gone through that experience as well, right and trying to stand by them and seeing that as a way in which, the, you know, one of the things about uh, tackling, confronting the Armenian genocide as someone today is that we have no power to change anything that happened a hundred years ago. But it's different when it comes to something that is happening today. And uh, one of that, one aspect of that is actually breaking the cycle of denial of the Armenian genocide and, you know, pushing for acknowledgement and justice. The other is through solidarity with other groups, right? Processing that trauma that you're referring to by being part of something that we can change today. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. David. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, Thank you very much, Dr. Murajan. It was really an honor and pleasure to hear you and to have you with us here. Um, I, I just want to add on that topic because my grandfather was a survivor of the uh, massacres in Baku in 1918, which was part of the wave. Um, and then he moved to Armenia, but his brother stayed in Baku. So his nephew, in 1988 was also a survivor of Baku pogroms. Recently, my cousins had to flee from uh, Lachin, Kasha in 2020. So this is mul multiple generations of family that are subjected to one or the other form of uh, aggression. And to your point is my perception of and the way I processed this hi history, of my family and of other people around me has significantly shifted after I started work at, 
what Johannesburg Holocaust Center would tally and as we were preparing for 2015 centenary. Because as I got ex more exposed to other genocides, to Holocaust and how it's taught and how it's presented, and there are so many commonalities. And then you look at what happens, some things that happen in South Africa today, and they periodically repeat, you know, be that xenophobic attacks or um, hate crimes of any sort. You, you understand that you're not alone at it and you, um, it is still, still actually relevant to, to, to address what can happen today and what can happen tomorrow. Thank you very much. Absolutely, I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khachig Muradian. Thank you very much for, for, for speaking to us for such a moving presentation and very thoughtful and very thought provoking. I look forward to unpacking some of these ideas that you expressed today um, in our following conversation um, on our podcast series. And I will share that conversation with everybody. So I look forward to, to engaging with you further. And I'm sure our listeners and our, and, and our audience will appreciate to listen to you further unpacking these ideas. So thank you very much for, for today. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. And also to David Ebrahamian and the Armenian youth of South Africa, thank you very much for organizing this event. And hopefully next year, we will be able to see each other in person, hopefully, if all goes, so. if all goes well. Hope so. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And to much. those of you, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. And to those of you who, who joined us this evening, thank you very much for taking the time out of your evening or wherever you are, out of your morning or afternoon to be part of this very, very special commemorative event. Um, keep well and I hope to see you very soon and hopefully live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep well. <laughs>